So, um, Qualcomm is not just interested in chips. We know that communication systems are end-to-end, -end, and we need to have a really good understanding of the end-to-end -end system to be able to develop new features and take the, the future uh, 5G and R to its future evolution. So that's why we actually spend a lot of effort building our own prototype system so we can actually do proof of concept type of testing and enhance our designs. So our uh, prototype networks includes all the main components from the core network to base stations to devices. So for example, uh, our core network in our OTA network is in-house developed and it supports standalone mode of operation. Our base stations, again, in-house developed our test base stations, support uh, enhanced digital beam forming with massive MIMO arrays. And you're going to hear more about our massive MIMO antenna array. It's a uh, 256 cross-pole element device, which enables us with great beam forming capabilities and enhanced capacity. And then we also use our NR devices. Initially, we started out with these large FPGA type of platforms in the early days of 5G, even before the release 15 standard was completed. And then we moved on to the mobile test platform. And then currently we're using the Qualcomm reference design based on X50, X55 chipsets. And then we've been working on this prototype system, using it to do verification and design evaluations for a very long time. You can see our timeline there. This year's MWC, we demonstrated the Release 15 compliant network and showed network capacity. And we're also utilizing this prototype system to look into what's next. Like for Release 16 and beyond, what are the new features that we want to work on this? Okay, that's what we utilize this net network to aid our design. <coughs> now, uh, what are the areas we're focusing on? So there are the fundamental areas that uh, we look at, which is more capacity. And we're utilizing uh, massive arrays to be able to multiplex more and more users and enhance capacity. We're also looking into user experience improvements. For example, we want to minimize interruption uh, when users are uh, doing mobility from one cell to the other. Or uh, we want to enable new services by lowering the latency and the reliability of the network. So those are the key areas that we focus a lot of our research energy into. But in addition to that, we're also looking into what new services can be supported with the, uh, uh, with the 5G technology, basically, what the 5G has to offer. Uh, one area is uh, extended reality. I think this is a very promising area. In the upcoming years, we're going to see more and more uses of that. And then actually following this demonstration, you'll be heading out to the tent to actually see an extended reality demonstration in our prototype network. So I won't talk more about that. I want to talk a little bit about positioning, which is also a very important feature for us that we spend a lot of effort in. Now positioning has been around for a very long time. We've been involved with it starting from the 3G days. But what 5G has to offer is the larger bandwidth and these massive antenna arrays which gives us a lot more capabilities in terms of being able to resolve the user's location. So that kind of opens up new venues. And uh, within the Release 16 framework, there are multiple techniques that are being utilized to uh, improve the positioning of the user. And in our OTA network, we're actually implementing and testing these actively. We are using RTT round-trip time-based uh, ranging. And then we also utilize our array, antenna array to actually have an accurate angle of arrival estimation. And combining the two, we're actually able to get a pretty good fix on the user location. Now, we're also using this network, as I said, to aid our design going into release 17 and beyond to be able to further improve the accuracy and capacity of positioning systems and maybe a UE based, uh, fully UE-based approach that's a lot more scalable and much more accurate positioning information to enable new use cases like industrial IoT asset tracking and so on and so forth. So these are some of, the, uh, some of the areas that we are focusing our energy on. This is actually on the positioning side an example of our OTA system. So we have our base station located at the top of building N, that's where the conference hall was. And then we placed different UEs outside, right outside this building. And actually, we were able to get a very accurate angle of arrival estimation from those UEs to aid us with the positioning. So that's just one example of how we use our prototype system to enhance our designs.
Now I'll leave it to Joe to talk a little bit about this uh, antenna array that you see behind me. Hey, thank you, Liz. Hi, I'm Joe Burke. I lead the radio antenna team here at Qualcomm in terms of the R&D for sub 6 5G. Radio antenna is really like if we start down at baseband, kind of digital and bits of signal processing, radio antenna takes it from that up to over the air frequencies. So one of the new things for 5G that Elise was talking about was this idea of spatial division multiplexing. You know, how do we take advantage of ideas like large arrays and how do we support multiple users better, smarter, faster? You know, kind of historically the CDM, FDM, TDM, like code division, multiple access, or time division, multiple access, frequency division, multiple access, different ways of how do you support more users for more rate, the latency, you know, all these other approaches. Spatial division multiple access, Spatial division multiple access is one of these new items we're pushing really strong for 5G. Um, you could take a little walk over here to the right to talk about this array. Um, these are kind of like massive mindle. Where's the massive in the mindle for 5G? This is the massive array. This is like the massive mindle right here. So what it really means is take a large array in the sense of 16 up and down like elevation elements. So 16 here and like 16 side to side horizontal. So it's like an elevation of an azimuth. And then take it down to baseband digital. And what we can do is electronically scan the baseband side to side up and down. So it's really like a 3D MIMO for this massive array. What, what uh, wavelength or what frequency is this? Good question. Yeah, this is at three and a half gigahertz. So it's like the sub six band. If you can see some of the milliwave wave demos going on, the arrays are much smaller. Also a lot of elements in those too. So really, 5G's taking advantage of like large arrays, large element arrays. In this case, for sub six and three and a half gigahertz, physically large also. What this gives us is this kind of pencil beam, you know, thought, right, in terms of like six and a half degrees azimuth, four and a half degrees elevation. It lets us steer kind of specifically multiple users at the same time, or support, say, multi-user simultaneously with spatial position multiplexing going on. Also, for position location, as you was just talking about, you know, typically position location is kind of reliable base, things like GPS. But this also gives us this side-to-side -side position on the beam scan as well as up and down from 3D beam forming. So it really gives us like three degrees of beam forming now. I'm sorry, three degrees of information now. Yeah. This, this array right here? Yeah. No, this is, uh, this is a smaller version. Yeah, so, you know, the question is, is this still three and a half gigahertz. Yeah, this would be like your large macro size array, really high ERP in terms of transmitted power, 65 dBm ERP for this. Some of the larger commercial ones are 75 dBm ERP. Still similar array, but just higher off the power. But that would be for like uh, suburban, rural, right? So there's also cases we want to have for our test networks. We're not a GNOB supplier commercially. This is more for our test network and then we also need like smaller cells. Right, so this is really like, a, take one fourth of this, this array here and we packaged it smaller for like our small cell, micro cell. Also, yeah. uh, how many elements in for, for polarization is this? 256 elements, so we're 16 by 16, 256 in this cross pole. So it's really effectively 512 driving point. Right. And, uh, and how many uh, antenna elements per beam? Great. Yeah, so you could say. Uh, so we, we, we have idea items like scan azimuth electronically and then elevation. We also have some uh, fixed combiners in here to try to minimize how many of these elements you take down the baseband. If you took 256 elements times two cross pulls all the way down the baseband, it makes the baseband a lot more complex for MIMO pre-coding and decoding. So this question of a, kind of a per user basis, think of all these three, all these antennas, uh, many of these antennas come down the baseband, 64. Right, so we have 256 times two is really 512. We have a fixed, like, uh, eight to one combiner in here. It really takes 64 antenna streams down the baseband. Then each user sees those 64 and processes in that, you know, kind of document. And also in terms of, I think, like, MIMO pre-coding or decoding, if you're familiar with that, like, how do you increase the number of users, right, at the same time and the same frequency? So what this lets us do is have, like, higher layers of MIMO as well. So this is a hybrid beam forming system? Yeah, I'd call it, uh, you know, usually hybrid beam form is a mix of ROP forming and digital beam forming. Right. This is more of a digital beam form with some fixed elements. So in terms of the elevation, we, as opposed to having, say, like RF phase shifters behind it, we just fix these with things like items like Wilkinson combiners, you know, fixed combiners. Uh, so part of this is like complexity. If you take this too, too high of degrees of freedom, it gets really complex for baseband processing.
Yeah. How much does something like this cost before putting it into a vendor? Yeah. Good question. So I, I can't talk to the commercial costs. I can just talk to the R&D side. I will say we supersize this. So at Qualcomm, we're looking for what's next in terms of 5G. So you could say uh, some of the commercial designs out there are a little bit smaller than this array. So the large array gives us even tighter beam forming accuracy in terms of you know, side to side. Well. Qualcomm doesn't make this. They're not selling it. This isn't, so, this isn't something that Qualcomm. We don't sell this commercial. Right, this would be an infrastructure problem. Exactly, yeah. So we don't, yeah, we don't sell infrastructure, but we do do testing. You know, we can step back over here to the right. Um, you, you think of years ago, we start, first started working on 5G, sub-6 and milliwave wave as well. Some of these early ideas of how, you know, what else can you do with the spatial uh, aspect of the design, right? You can take the handset by itself independent, you take the Geno V by itself, but you really need to bring them together. So this is this idea of, uh, you know, really kind of analysis and simulation that we do here for Qualcomm, and you gotta go build it, right? Ideas are easy. Until you go make it, test it out, they don't believe it. So the idea of building it, and then in this case, we built as Julius was talking about the early kind of UE designs, right? In terms of like modem and RF that went with this. There was an earlier version of this for the handset, also, it's a little bit bigger for the kind of the modem as well as the radio. That was our first prototype, it was on wheels, right? Um, and then that led to you know these kind of smaller form factors. But we also have to fill out the whole system, and so the other side of this is filling out the GLB design. So, you know, that array, part of what we tested up here, and you kind of look in the back there, that white covers the radome on that, then we've taken that and put it up on the roof, so we can do over there live testing. Um, 